Hi, I'm Andrew Adams, and this video is about Halide, a new language and compiler that makes it much easier to write fast image processing pipelines across a range of platforms. We're interested in the pipelines you find in your camera and PC and mobile apps like Adobe Lightroom and Instagram. The big idea of Halide is to separate the definition of the algorithms in the pipeline from the concerns of optimization, things like SIMD vectorization, tiling, or parallelization. This makes the algorithms much simpler, more modular, and more portable. The programmer is still responsible for choosing which optimizations to apply, but it's much easier to define and explore optimizations than in a language like C or CUDA. They're defined very tersely, independently of the algorithm, and most importantly, changing the optimizations is guaranteed not to change the result. First, let's look at why existing languages are insufficient for fast image processing. If we want to do a simple 3x3 box filter, we might write C++ code that looks like this. So we've decomposed the filter into a horizontal blur, which reads and then averages three points from the input, and then a vertical blur, which reads and averages three points from our intermediate result, which we store in a temporary image. This code takes about 10 milliseconds per megapixel on the quad-core x86 that I benchmarked it on. But an optimized implementation for this machine is more than 10 times faster. The code is hideously complex. All we're trying to do is average together 3x3 three three pixels. But an 11x speed up is too much to ignore. So, why is this code fast? We've transformed the pipeline to optimize for both parallelism and locality. The parallelism comes from distributing work across threads, and that's what that Pragma OMP Parallel 4 at the top does and also from computing in eight wide SIMD chunks on each core's SSE unit. Exposing parallelism, though, is only half the story. Just as important, and often much harder to think about or express, is locality. For example, making sure the pixels produced by one stage are still in cache when the next stage reads them. And without locality optimization, even a really well parallelized pipeline will probably be limited by the available memory bandwidth. So here the optimized code improves locality by computing each stage in tiles, interleaving the computation of tiles across stages. So we compute just a single tile of blur in X and then a single tile of blur in Y, and then we go back to compute the next tile of blur in X. So this, hopefully, keeps all that intermediate data in small buffers that never leave cache. But it complicates the code because it's interleaved the computation of each stage. So the execution of the pipeline looks like this. The input image is at the top, flowing down through the blur X and blur Y stages below. The earlier stages are evaluated over larger buffers because we're computing filters that have a footprint, so we need more inputs than there are outputs. Each point in blur Y, the output stage, depends on three pixels in blur X, which in turn depend on nine pixels total in the input. So the unoptimized version that we looked at first computes every pixel in the first stage, writing them out to memory before computing the next stage, which has to slowly read them back in. The optimized version interleaves the stages instead. To compute a chunk of blur Y, we first need the corresponding chunk of blur X, which loads a chunk of the input. The blur X stage filters that input, and then blur Y immediately consumes it to compute a chunk of the output. So next we throw away that intermediate data, that chunk of blur x, load the next chunk of the input, compute the next chunk of blur x, followed immediately by that next chunk of blur y. So we've moved the computation of each chunk of pixels in a consumer stage closer in time to the computation of its inputs. This improves producer-consumer locality by keeping all the intermediate data nearby in local caches but it's made optimization a global problem of carefully interleaving the computation and storage down an entire imaging pipeline. You can't address locality just by optimizing stages in isolation or by just tweaking operations in your inner loops. Also, we're making a trade-off here. We're saying that for each chunk of blur Y, we should independently compute, consume, and then throw away the required chunk of blur X. This means that neighboring chunks which depend on overlapping pixels from higher up in the pipeline, do redundant work where they overlap. Now for this pipeline, 
it made sense to redundantly compute some values in exchange for the increase in locality that we get by never letting the intermediate values move out of cache into main memory. But, but this is not always the right choice. Let's try to get a full handle on the space of choices we could have made. In general, in an imaging pipeline, there are two questions you must answer for each stage. The first is, in what order should that stage compute its values? Let's look at some choices. The most common way to traverse a region is in scanline order. This means we traverse a region of a function sequentially across y, and within that, sequentially across x. This walks down scanlines, just like the loops you would typically write in C. We can transpose the x and y dimensions, which gives a column major traversal, which walks down each column in turn. Or we could go back to scanline order, but traverse the x dimension in vectors of width 4. We could distribute the scan lines across parallel threads. Finally, we can split the x and y dimension into tiles, which opens up further rec recursive choices for the order of the outer and inner components of each dimension. By traversing the outer components outside the inner components, we get a simple tiled traversal. That's the first question. The second question is more subtle. When should each stage compute its inputs? Let's look at some options. Here we have a visualization of the blur pipeline. On the left is the input, on the right is the output, and in the middle is the blur and X stage. Green means we're reading, red means we're writing, and blue means we've allocated a temporary buffer. So right now we're reading from the input and using it to write to the blur and X stage. We read three values from the input, one, two, three, to compute a single value of the blurred in X stage. We haven't even started writing to the output yet. So the choice we've made here is that we're going to compute all of the blur in X stage before computing any of the blur in Y stage. If we phrase this as a decision made by blur in Y, that decision is compute all of my inputs ahead of time before I start computing any of my values. So, what's the pitfall with this approach? Why is this slow? The answer is, of course, locality. By the time the blur and Y stage goes to read some of the intermediate data, it's probably been evicted from cache. So that load will be slow and will be limited by the system memory bandwidth. So let's look at a different option. Here, we compute three values of blurred in X by reading nine values from the input, and we immediately use that to compute one value of the output. So here we get maximum locality. We're using data as soon as it's available without giving it any time to be evicted from a cache. What's the pitfall here? Well, if you look carefully at what the blurred in X stage is doing, you'll realize that we're doing a lot of wasted work. Each point in blurred in X is redundantly recomputed three times. Okay, well, maybe we can figure out how to get around that. Here's another choice. At first, it's going to look similar, but notice that we've allocated enough memory to keep around all of the intermediate stage, and we're not throwing away values as we go. That means when we get to the second scan line, we can start reusing values that we, re that we computed earlier. So great. We have locality, and we're not doing any redundant work. What's the pitfall here? We've introduced a serial dependence in the scan lines of the output. We're relying on the fact that we've computed scan line n minus 1 before we can start computing scan line n. This means that we can't parallelize across scan lines with this strategy. With the previous two strategies, we could. So this approach has poor parallelism. These three strategies are the extreme cases of a rich space of choices you can make. One way to lay out this space is by considering the granularity of storage and compute, i.e. how large are the buffers you allocate for intermediate data, and do you fill them in one pixel at a time, or one scan line at a time, or in larger chunks still. If you allocate the full amount necessary for an intermediate buffer and fill it up in one big blob ahead of time, then that's coarse-grain computation and coarse-grain storage, and your locality suffers. 
If you independently store and compute just what you need for each output pixel, then you're doing fine-grained computation using fine-grained storage, and you might end up doing wasted work. If you allocate a large buffer but fill it in as late as possible while reusing old values, then you're doing fine-grained computation into coarse-grained storage. Now, taking advantage of this reuse, as we saw, made it harder to parallelize. So those were the extreme ends of the choice space, but all the fast schedules are somewhere in the middle and traverse the output image in more complex ways. This one has split the output into four tiles, and for each tile, first it computes everything you need of the intermediate buffer using vectors of width four. And there are two threads. One does the top two tiles, and the other one does the bottom two tiles. This one computes the output in scan lines, vectorized and parallelized within each scan line. It stores everything computed so far of the intermediate buffer so that it can reuse the previous few scan lines. This one starts out pretty similar to the last one. It still vectorizes within each scan line and walks down the scan lines reusing old values. However, instead of using threads to fill in individual scan lines more quickly, here we slice the output in two and one thread works on the top half, one thread works on the bottom half. This ends up doing a little bit of redundant work here at the boundary uh, but the two threads aren't hammering the same area of memory. This is the fastest schedule we've found for Blur. So some of those schedules are pretty complex, and Blur is just this trivial two-stage pipeline. A more realistic pipeline looks like this thing on the right. This is local Laplacian filters. It computes a set of Gaussian and Laplacian pyramids and blends them together. For each link between two stages, the dependencies are pretty simple and constrained, just like in our 3x3 three three Blur. But when you combine all of these local decisions, the performance consequences are far-reaching and complex. So in this pipeline, there are lots of choices about the degree of fusion at each of dozens of stages. And each strategy can mean a totally different set of dozens of kernels or loop nests, completely restructuring our code. And the difference between two plausible sounding strategies can be significant. So locality is hard, not just because it globally interleaves the computation of the whole pipeline, but also because it requires trade-offs, like introducing redundant computation in exchange for saving memory bandwidth, or sacrificing parallelism to get better reuse. This can be pretty hard to reason about. Uh, usually I just have to try things and see what works. Only in hindsight, maybe I can justify why it was a good idea. So it's a hard problem. The thing that makes it really difficult in practice is that existing languages make it hard to express or explore these optimizations for parallelism and locality. Traditional languages like C make both parallelism and locality hard to express and also hard for the compiler to infer because when you write C you tend to over-specify these things. Newer languages like CUDA and OpenCL make the data parallelism easier, but they still leave fusion for locality as a manual process that requires rewriting all of your code for any given fusion strategy. Libraries of optimized routines, things like Intel performance primitives and OpenCV, aren't enough either, because individually optimized kernels still compose into inefficient pipelines. They can't interleave stages for locality across those function boundaries. So we believe the right answer is to decouple the definition of the algorithm from the concerns of locality and parallelism, which we call the schedule. In Halide, the algorithm defines what values are computed for each pipeline stage, while the schedule defines where and when they're computed. This makes it easier for the programmer to write algorithms with lots of the unnecessary details stripped away and to compose them into pipelines. It also makes it easy for programmers to specify and explore optimizations, because unlike in C, changing the schedule is guaranteed not to change the meaning of the algorithm. Once you've defined an algorithm and a schedule, it's actually pretty easy for a fairly dumb compiler to do the mechanical work of generating fast code. So once we strip out the concerns of optimization, the algorithm is defined as a series of functions from pixel coordinates to the expressions that give the values of those coordinates. These functions have no side effects. They can be evaluated over any point in an infinite domain, and the required region of each stage will be inferred by the compiler. The execution order and storage of points in each function are left unspecified. Points can be evaluated or re-evaluated in any order. The results can be cached, duplicated, thrown away, or recomputed without changing the meaning. 
For the 3x3 blur, the resulting code looks like this. The first stage, blur x, is defined at any point x, y as the average of three points in the input. Then blur y, at any point x, y, is the average of three points in blur x. So given an algorithm in this form, the schedule is then responsible for two things, answering the two questions we saw earlier. First, it has to specify for every stage in the pipeline in what order to compute the pixels produced by that stage. And second, for every producer-consumer relationship in the pipeline, it has to specify how the computation of the two is interleaved. The nice thing about Halide is that you can specify these two things in a few lines of code without touching the code that defines your algorithm. I won't go into the syntax now, but here's the Halide code that gives the traversal orders we've seen so far. Each of these has its own trade-off between locality, parallelism, and redundant recompute. So you might think that Halide is fast because we generate good parallel vector code. That's true, that's necessary, but it's not sufficient. The real reason we're fast is because we make it easy for a programmer to explore this choice space. If you sit down, think really hard about the problem, and write code once, even if you're an expert, you're probably not going to produce fast code. You need to try things, you need to iterate, and Halide makes it faster to iterate. For Blur, the entire pipeline looks like this. This is the same algorithm from before, annotated with a schedule equivalent to the optimized C++ from the beginning of the talk. First, it schedules Blur Y to be evaluated in tiles of 256 by 32, and for each of these tiles to be computed in eight wide vectors across the X dimension and across parallel threads in the Y dimension. Then, it schedules the intermediate, Blur X, to be evaluated in chunks as needed for each tile of the output, and also vectorizes it across X. This generates nearly identical machine code, in fact, to the C++, but with just two lines each of algorithm and schedule. And unlike the C, the Halide version makes it easy to add new stages, change the computation, or change the schedule. It can also compile to fast ARM Neon code, and with a few tweaks to the schedule, we can get a GPU implementation. Okay, now let's get into some technical details about how Halide is built. Halide's not a standalone language. It's embedded in C++, which means we use and abuse C++ operator overloading to build Halide expressions and functions. When you want to evaluate one of these functions into an image, we just-in-time compile to build and run a Halide pipeline. If you want to avoid the overhead of just-in-time compiling, or if you don't want to link our full compiler into your binary, you can also statically compile a Halide pipeline to produce a quite small C object file and header. And the C object file includes its own runtime, so you have no other runtime dependencies. This is what we do for production code, especially code that's going to run on mobile devices. Internally, Halide leans very heavily on the LLVM compiler infrastructure. We take the Halide function definitions and the schedule and combine these to produce a single blob of scheduled imperative code in Halide's internal representation. After some basic optimization passes, this is then converted to LLVM's internal representation and then LLVM compiles it to vectorized x86 or ARM code or to the graphs of CUDA kernels and the CPU code that is required to launch and manage them. Recently we've been adding some more targets. We can generate GLSL shaders, uh, we can generate native client x86 and ARM if you want to embed some Halide computation in your browser, and we can also generate OpenCL shaders that either use the bitcode representation Spire or the C-like source code representation. Let's look at some uh, example applications that we've implemented in Halide. The first one was a rewrite of the software post-processing pipeline from the Franken camera project, which does the basic steps necessary to turn a raw sensor data uh, into a usable image. So it denoises, it demosaics, it color corrects, and it applies a tone curve. Now, I wrote the original code here. It was pretty painful to write uh, because it needed to be very fast on an OMAP3, which is an ARM processor that was in the Franken camera. It was 500 lines of C with vector intrinsics and then large blocks of hand-tuned assembly where we couldn't get the compiler to do the right thing with the vector intrinsics. 
and each time I wanted to try some new strategy for optimizing it, like fusing two stages, I had to move around large blocks of code and then fix all of the bugs I had just introduced, and then more often than not, the result was slower and I had to revert. So we, re we rewrote this mess in Halide. Uh, the resulting code was significantly shorter and it ran slightly faster than the hand-tuned assembly because we were able to find a better schedule fairly quickly. So here we found we could meet the performance of carefully handwritten code, even assembly, but because we make it much easier to explore alternative strategies, we'll often find something faster. For our next application, we moved slightly further down the photographic post-processing pipeline and looked at local Laplacian filters, which I mentioned earlier. Adobe uses it in Lightroom for what they call clarity. It increases local contrast by processing an image in multiple ways and then fusing the results together using a Laplacian pyramid. We compared our implementation to code from the original authors. They used Intel performance primitives to accelerate operations like building the pyramids and OpenMP for parallelizing other parts. It amounted to 262 lines of optimized C++. We wrote and tested our halide version, which took 62 lines of code to describe the same algorithm. Then without touching the code that defines the algorithm, we spent an afternoon trying out a range of different schedules that inlined, parallelized, and vectorized different stages in different ways. And in the end, we found a seven-line schedule that ran more than twice as fast as the original on the same processor. So before I mention that GPU number, just as an aside, how could we beat Intel performance primitives? The win here came largely from inlining certain stages and accepting some redundant computation as a result. Intel performance primitives is a library of routines optimized in isolation. They can't do this sort of fusion down pipelines. So another nice aspect of Halide is that it makes porting to the GPU much easier. By changing just a few lines in the schedule, we instead generate mixed CPU-GPU code that runs seven times faster than the original CPU version. In fact, my collaborator on this project, Jonathan Reagan Kelly, spent some time at Adobe, and he took a day to rewrite their version of local Laplacian filters in Halide and integrate it into Lightroom. It was more than twice as fast as their version, which they spent several months optimizing, and now they can run it on the GPU as well. Another popular algorithm in photographic post-processing pipelines is the bilateral filter, which can be used for tone mapping, enhancing local contrast, and smoothing. The bilateral grid is a data structure that helps us compute a bilateral filter very quickly. One interesting thing about it for our purposes is that the first stage can't be expressed as a gather. It additively scatters data from the input image into computed locations in the grid. In fact, it computes a histogram per tile of the input. This can be modeled as a type of reduction, which Halide supports. We took the bilateral grid algorithm and implemented it in Halide, comparing it to a carefully written but pretty clean C++ version done by the original authors. Our version uses one third of the code and runs six times faster. With a different schedule, we can run on the GPU instead. We looked at Chen's handwritten CUDA version and started with a schedule that matched his strategy. This was uh, initially slightly s slower than his code because uh, he makes clever use of texture sampling units. We tried a few alternative schedules and we found a slightly non-intuitive one, a slightly less parallel one, in fact, that was twice as fast as his code. Halide isn't doing anything here you couldn't do yourself manually, but with Halide, it's easier and faster to try out unintuitive optimization strategies that sometimes pay off. For our last application, we decided to try a vision algorithm. So we implemented a level set segmentation algorithm that iteratively refines the boundaries of selected regions. Our reference implementation here is written in MATLAB, which is very terse, so the halide version is somewhat longer. However, the halide version is about 70 times faster on the same CPU. Now it's easy to make MATLAB slow. For example, you can manually loop over pixels. But this code doesn't do that. This code does everything right. It's all expressed as single line whole image operations. There should be no interpreter overhead. I think what's going on is that MATLAB is taking the library approach. Under the hood, maybe these whole image operations are very highly optimized, but when you stitch them together, the pipeline becomes hopelessly limited by memory bandwidth. Now our halide version also expresses the algorithm as the same sequence of simple whole image operations, 
but our schedule fuses all of these together into a single parallel loop over pixels. If we want to beat up on MATLAB a little more, just for fun, we can change a single line of code to run on the GPU instead, and now we're over a thousand times faster on the same machine. If you'd like to try Halide, you can. It's open source, under a permissive license, and it's up at halide-lang.org. We really hope that it makes it much easier for people to write high-performance imaging code. Of course, there are some limitations and sharp edges. Halide only does feed-forward pipelines that operate on image data. So we can't express other data structures like lists or trees. And while it would be nice to have the compiler figure out a good schedule for you, currently you must always specify a schedule, and some schedules will produce very slow code. But with those limitations in mind, we'd be very happy for people to try out the compiler and help us improve it.